Tackle It Health and Wellness Society bring to you Telling Their Stories, a podcast that brings to you testimonies from families and friends of Canadian high school and university-aged football players who have had a member pass away by suicide or who are dealing with mental health issues or illness themselves. My name is Katie Utley, founder of Tackle It. I will be interviewing families and others who may be experiencing or have experienced these tragic and difficult life circumstances and mental health challenges. I will also be chatting with other mental health and wellness professionals and coaches about these issues. Conversations may deal with sensitive issues such as depression, substance abuse, suicide, sexual assault, and more, and may trigger an emotional response from you. This may not be the right series for you, or you may want to watch and or listen with a trusted adult or friend. If at any time you are in crisis, please call Kids Help Phone at 1-800-SUICIDE. 784-2433. Also listed on our website at tackleit.org or visit crisisservicescanada.ca. Opinions of our guests are their own. We wish to bring perspectives from all sides and walks of life as everyone can learn from something from others' experiences and viewpoints. We aim to respect those views and opinions. And now let's honor those who are telling their stories. Welcome to Telling Their Stories podcast for TackleIt.org. We are in for a treat today. We're speaking with one of our mental health sports psychology professionals. We have uh, a doctor in sports psychology, Wilkem Falcon. He's a postdoctoral research fellow in sport management at the HEC um, Montreal uh, University. So William, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. We are going to, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Um, you know, we've spoken in some previous conversations and you've got a lot of really interesting stuff that you're doing with your research. Um, and as well as have given, even in our previous conversations, have given me some great insight and some and some questions that I want to ask you in, in a little bit. But give us some uh, an idea of, you know, how you got into this area, what what you're doing now with your research um, kind of where you're going for the future, and then we'll get started on some other uh, discussion stuff. Yeah, it will be a pro- pleasure. So uh, once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, welcome everyone, all the listeners and viewers. I'm really happy to be here and share a little bit of my experience, my knowledge, uh, what I've found through my research and reading other uh, researchers' work in the field in a way that hopefully can help uh, the practitioners <clears throat> and athletes out there as well. So uh, I, I'm originally from Brazil, and uh, I'd like to start, start the story there because it, it had a very big impact on shaping my values and beliefs and what really drove me to do the type of research that I do. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, growing up in Brazil, um, I witnessed firsthand the, the consequences really of um, lack of uh, positive role models in youth's lives, uh, living in a developing country with uh, a lot of economic challenges, um, a lot of at youth, uh, at risk youth, excuse me. So uh, living in this environment, growing in this environment and witnessing these uh, stories always uh, made me want to try to help. Uh, help them improve the quality of life in particular youth. And as a young teenager, I was very active in sports, uh, played a lot of uh, basketball, uh, was always outside playing and yeah. doing various sports and different things. And at a very young age, I noticed the impact that sport had on youth life. And even youth in, from underserved communities, uh, youth who lived in the streets, uh, that's unfortunately quite common in Brazil. You would see how physical activity and sport was very engaging and motivating, yeah. intrinsically motivating activity uh, for them. So I always thought about this uh, a sport as a tool that could uh, bring uh, youth in and provide them a positive environment to develop and grow, right? Mm-hmm. At the time, I didn't really frame it this way, of <laughs> course, but the feeling was there. Right. So uh, after my undergraduate degree, in, which I did in Brazil, I moved to Montreal to pursue uh, graduate studies at McGill University mm-hmm. in sports psychology. 
And I did my master's and PhD there in the field of uh, youth development through sport, in particular coaching strategies that foster development. So that's that was my way of uh, sort of tapping into my passion of sport, yeah. uh, along with these personal beliefs of trying to use sport as a tool for development. So again, through my graduate uh, study, uh, my graduate studies, and the research that I conducted was really trying to identify ways and strategies that coaches could use sports to foster personal development, Mm -hmm. understanding what is uh, development, what what is the, what do we mean when we say this in the sport context, and also finding ways to translate that knowledge to coaches. So teach and educate coaches on how to use that. Wow. What an experience, you know, to uh, have such different cultures Um, from where you grew up to up here. I mean, you must be able to add so many different layers to the area that you're researching just from that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting to uh, notice or see the contextual, the cultural and contextual environmental factors that really uh, affect these relations. And I think that uh, speaks a lot to the different experiences that youth have in different communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, across Canada, right? Uh, most of the work I do uh, is in Montreal yeah. uh, and in um, uh, underserved communities here. But even in Montreal, uh, we can see how different the reality is in these different communities. So, yeah, I'd like to think that being from a, a different country uh, makes me a little more uh, maybe sensitive to these uh, mm-hmm. environmental and cultural differences that we see. What do you see with the youngsters nowadays in terms of maybe not specifically yet just with sport, but what do you see the pressures that they're facing? How, how do you um, like with working with at-risk youth or um, even, you know, growing up in Brazil, what do you see as a general trend maybe that are, is emerging? And I mean, with the obvious one being COVID right now, but, you know, social media or just the way kids are being raised, you know, um, socioeconomical factors. What are you seeing to be on the forefront of issues that we really need to be looking at with our youngsters? Yeah, I, I think these issues, they vary greatly uh, depending on the context where you're in, right? In uh, uh, very underserved, extremely underserved communities, uh, there are issues related to resources, positive adult role models uh, that are uh, a lot more present and uh, serious than we may think Mm. right Um, being in brazil and understanding the the challenges that are faced there there are some things that you expect but uh, i i was surprised uh, coming to montreal canada and seeing a lot of the same issues where Mm. uh, some children for example in these underserved communities they don't have food they don't have enough money to eat so when you start the conversation there it really uh, grounds things uh, into what is that we're really talking about when we're trying to support youth in, uh, uh, in underserved communities. Yeah. But in other places where uh, they may have a little more resources, I see other problems in youth sport that relate to early specialization that seems to be a trend yeah. that unfortunately has been growing over the years of early specializing children to specific sports or even positions within sports Mm -hmm. uh, that can cause a lot of developmental challenges and issues with when we speak of uh, long-term engagement in physical activity and sport as well, such as uh, burnout, injuries, and things of that nature that are not healthy. So I think it depends a lot on the context where uh, you're working and with whom but uh, I would probably, li- I, I, I think, uh, I, I think we're going to get to this later on, but I think w- the underlying uh, aspect that coaches especially should really focus on is on building relationships. Yeah. Right? So the ability of building relationships with youth as an adult role model, uh, be a coach or an athletic director or uh, whatever it may be, uh, that has important positive implications in the life of youth, uh, regardless really of what is the need at hand. But yeah. just being able to build that uh, that uh, open communication and gain access to uh, 
personal issues or challenges that go beyond sport, that really seemed to be the key to unlocking the potential and really helping uh, youth th- through sport. Well, and it's interesting um, while you were talking and you're talking about role models. Um, I recently just read um, the book by Trevor Mord. He's the sports psychologist. Uh, I'm probably have his title wrong. He works with Russell Wilson and, and the high, like high, high echelon athletes. And uh, in part, in one of the things in his book was that he said he realized he was a role model, and um, and he differentiated it between um, being a role model and being a mentor. And I thought that was interesting because I've interchanged the two. I never kind of really separated them. So it was interesting how he he kind of approached that, like he said he was a mentor, but then he realized he was a role model and that his example was um, spoke a lot more loudly than he had at first thought of. What do you think about that? Like in terms of um, the two differentiating terms? I think it's uh, the way I see it is that the role of the the, the mentor is a guide right? Mm -hmm. So maybe if you're looking at a role model as being an example and uh, the mentor being a guide, uh, I think uh, coaches should really strive to be mentors and trying to guide their youth, not only through the sport, their athletic development or the skills or the wins, but also helping shape them of who they will be outside of the field or court, right? So, uh, if if that is the distinguish uh, the the, dis- the difference that is made, um, I think ultimately, whatever you want to call it, uh, coaches should be striving to impact the lives of youth yeah. beyond sport. Because I think sometimes um, the way that I'm I'm reading it. Um, a- in terms of maybe steps, I think that coaches will say, okay, I'm a role model and they just live their life, you know, well, and the kids see that example. But I think the mentor, like you said, is a guide and you take it that one step further in that development of that relationship with the player in building into their life and not just um, letting them watch you live. And so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because when we talk about coaching science and the literature and the the whole field of research that addresses coaching, uh, sport coaching, there is there's this uh, evolution. And I'll speak specifically to youth sport coaching, that transition from uh, early days of the coach is someone who teaches sport. And there's a lot of comparison between teachers, classroom teachers and coaches in the way that they work. But it, then it, it became more than that to not just teaching athletic skills or performance skills, but also to teaching a positive uh, development general uh, skills that could help individuals grow in life, right? So I don't want to get too theoretical here and bore the listeners, <laughs> but uh, uh, the things uh, such as uh, building confidence that would apply to sport context, but also outside, right? Things, uh, building connections and networking, uh, being able to work t- with teams. And these are all co- the things that our coaches nowadays are very much aware of. Mm-hmm. Uh, character is also a big one, respecting the rules, respecting others. Uh, and more recently, this literature in youth uh, sport coaching and development has focused more on what is referred to as life skills. So teaching skills that are applicable outside of the sport context. So uh, you can talk about uh, teamwork, leadership, communication, uh, and what where the research is right now and where it's really pushing towards is that the role of the coach is not just within the boundaries of sport, but really uh, teaching uh, these life skills and also teaching how to transfer these life skills to other uh, life contexts. Mm. So you're going to teach your athletes to communicate well on the field. Yes, because we're working within the sport context 
And but you shouldn't stop there and hope or assume that they're going to take these communication skills and apply it to their classroom or social mm-hmm. lives or family life, mm-hmm. but really guide them through how is it that what you learn today at practice applies to your classroom? How is it that you can do this in your classroom and guide them through that? So that's when you start seeing that transition from uh, if you're using uh, the terms that you brought up, the role model to the mentor mm. or uh, the uh, there's a nonprofit organization I work with here in Montreal called Pour Trois Point, and uh, we use a lot of this word, a sport coach to a life coach, right? right? So you're not just uh, teaching life skills within the sport context, but you're also taking a step further and teaching the transfer, how to apply this outside of sport. And this is re- refers back to what I was speaking earlier about building this communication with that, or relationship and communication with athletes that go beyond sport. And I think this is really what a lot of youth who participate in sport is really, are really looking for, someone that can impact their lives beyond the sport setting. I feel that a lot of times, you know, these these contexts or are maybe, you know, everyone's assuming they're talking about a, an athlete who, you know, comes from a very pretty stable background. Um, you know, maybe they have, maybe they still have both parents. And if they don't, they the family life is stable. Kids are given opportunities that a regular uh, child in a, let's say middle-class family would have. Those youngsters that have, um, you know, they're experiencing mental health or distress or for whatever reason, they don't have that stability. They don't, like you said, they're at risk youth or they, you know, the basic needs of living are not there, are not met. They don't have food. They don't have the right clothing, all that kind of stuff. How does that ability of the coach to, to, to teach those life skills go into these players that are really dealing with a lot heavier issues? Um, because it kind of goes past that, I think, in my in my point. And the coaches that I've been speaking with really feel inadequate and in that they are not the appropriate people to be doing that. So what mm. would you say to them? First, before I address the coaches, I think uh, that that's the that's the the strength of this uh, change in approach of coaching, right? Uh, coaching a lot like other fields of science have shifted from a deficit reduction approach. That's what we called where you have a problem that you want to fix the problem, right? So if you're in an underserved community, there are plenty of problems to be solved. But if you're in a privileged setting, there's not as many problems. Mm -hmm. But we moved away from that. And we try to focus more now is on promoting strengths, right? So what are the resources available and what are the strengths available and how can we build on that? Mm -hmm. And when you take that approach, you realize that it is applicable to any setting. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you are working in a setting where uh, your athletes uh, are very privileged, there are still things to be done and there are still things to build upon. And this is important to consider. And if you are working in an underserved setting that has a lot of needs, uh, it is important to remember there are also a lot of qualities and strengths in these settings and knowing how to tap into that to build upon those resources is very important. Mm -hmm. And that is what's really going to build that independence and that autonomy in your athletes and in the community that will allow it to grow in a positive way. Yeah. So uh, what I tell, what I would tell coaches is exactly that is to think about the strengths and potentials and resources that are available to you, regardless of where you're, t- where you're coaching and how is it that you can impact the lives of the youth and the community where you and they are in a positive way. Well, and that's, you know, that's super important when, as we're seeing now, the de- decrease in, in youth participating in sport. Um, not just in football, but I think that's on, on, on many sports. I do think a part of that is in the relationships that aren't being developed between coach and player. And so tell us a little bit about the research that you've been doing in that area. So uh, my research is really focused on uh, the coaching behaviors and coaching strategies that will uh, promote development, right? And when we're talking about development, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about general positive uh, uh, skills, I would Mm -hmm. say. 
Mm -hmm. uh, relate to feeling more confident, building positive relationships with others, uh, but also specific life skills like the communication and leadership and all of that. Uh, and uh, my area of research focuses on one specific approach that we call the humanistic coaching approach. And that focuses a lot on giving athlete autonomy and decision making. So allowing athletes to make decisions about the team and the coach in that approach uh, addresses or relates to the athletes a lot more as a facilitator to okay. their sport experience mm -hmm. than a director uh, or a decision maker, right? Or a so, dictator. Or a dictator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll say it. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but that, but that's just one of the approaches that we use, and uh, we've su successfully implemented this approach uh, once again with the nonprofit organization that I've worked with for a long time. Mm -hmm. A lot of my research has been done uh, in collaboration with them. Uh, it's a Bhutan Point organization in Montreal. Uh, they offer training to youth sport coaches okay. or individuals who are interested in that. Yes. So uh, they offer a one-year training program that. Uh, touches on multiple aspects of society, social change, communities, uh, humanistic coaching is one part of this uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. And then for a whole year, uh, the organization through part through partnerships with uh, high schools, yeah. they provide coaches with a team to coach. So they are followed by a mentor. Uh, a developmental counselor yeah. and, and that uh, guides them through applying all these uh, strategies that they learn through multiple workshops. So it's a combination of this theoretical knowledge with the practical knowledge. Yeah. And there's also a lot of uh, personal development through that. So, but that is just one of the approaches. There are multiple other approaches to youth sport coaching, uh, autonomy supportive, uh, mastery skill, uh, transformational leadership. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is the common denominator with all of them is really building a trusting relationship with the youth. Mm -hmm. And that really, in my mind, is the key to uh, addressing uh, the bigger issue of personal development through sport. Because uh, in order for you to understand what are the needs uh, and what are the strengths of the youth that you're working with, you need to be able to build a trusting relationship where the youth will share with you uh, information that goes beyond the, the, their sport life. Right. And that is when you'll be able to help them. So um, I've had example of coaches who uh, spoke to teachers to try to learn more about the, uh, how the students or how the athletes are doing in school and then provide the follow-up support. I actually heard a, a story of a coach that was uh, pretty impressive. He attended class for a whole day in to live exactly what his athletes were going through. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he asked for permission in school, of course, and uh, yeah. he was in the classroom with them. And uh, he realized uh, how difficult it was, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as a coach, he came in with the coach plan, uh, the practice plan ready, and he would just uh, run the drills and be mad at them because they weren't paying attention and all <laughs> that stuff. And then we realized they just spent eight hours sitting down listening to people talk. The last thing they wanted is someone to talk to them for another hour sure. and a half. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he through that, he made changes to his practice to uh, make sure that his athletes were moving more and try mm. to be less and uh, allow them to make more decisions and take more control of their environment. Right. So the sports setting became a safer environment where they could express themselves and yeah. uh, have their voices heard. And that really improved the, the relationship he had with the athletes where mm -hmm. the athletes felt they could trust him more and communicate more. And then you hear a lot of other stories about athletes opening up about problems at home or as yeah. I mentioned, problems at school. And this is where the, the role model can become the mentor, right. Mm -hmm. And where you, the, a coach can, uh, uh, try to guide the, the his athletes or her athletes to uh, becoming 
better human beings that will have a positive impact in their communities. But it really starts there. It starts in the getting to know them and building trust to the point where they will share those uh, issues with you. I know a lot of really fantastic coaches, but I also know a lot of coaches that aren't doing what you've just described. (laughs) And unfortunately, I think that has a a really negative and devastating effect, i.e. kids dropping out of sport, not wanting to play, that type of thing. So for a lack of a more sensitive way to say this, how can we weed those people out? <laughs> so you see, that's, a, that's a good point. Or, or train them to be more what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, don't take the deficit reduction approach here. <laughs> like I said, I didn't know how to say it right, so you got my gist with that. Right, take take the take the strength promotion uh, part. There I don't we go. Leave them out because these people, they're good coaches. They are. They are good coaches. They are. Yes. There's a. There's a, a foundational paper in Coach Science by two of uh, some of the top researchers in the world that describe three types of coaching knowledge. Okay. Uh, so there's a professional knowledge, which is what we immediately identify as being a good coach, someone who's very knowledgeable in the sport, the strategies, able to read plays really quickly, uh, uh, observe skills and, t- and correct skills. Uh, but the coach knowledge doesn't stop there, right? Mm -hmm. There's another interpersonal knowledge, which is the ability to communicate and relate to others. And this is where you start noticing that some coaches don't have that, which refer to some of the coaches you may be uh, (laughs) speaking to. uh, That they can uh, can watch a game or uh, they can run a practice and uh, it's great skill-wise, strategy-wise, it's great. But then when they try to communicate and teach and transfer their knowledge to the athlete, there's a lot of problems there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, learning how to communicate and learning how to relate to the athletes, uh, that is very important as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, I always talk about when I'm talking about the, that humanistic approach that I talk about is uh, how many times the coach feels that he needs to say the same thing to the coach, mm. to the athlete, sorry. Right. So I, I coached for five years and I remember yelling the same thing for three months and my athletes not doing what I wanted them to do, right? And I'm always looking at them as the culprit, like, why don't you listen, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of looking at myself and saying, what is it that I'm doing that is not translating? Right, to good that, point. Right? And so I started developing my interpersonal knowledge and which was convenient because I also doing research on that, on that at the same time. So, uh, and that starts helping a lot, uh, any coach. And there's a third type of knowledge that uh, relates to exactly what I uh, spoke last, which is the intrapersonal knowledge. So getting to know yourself. Okay. And this is, uh, it, this, I won't say it's the least uh, uh, popular or common knowledge in coaches, I think it's the least spoken of Okay. because when I speak to coaches about it, I realize that a lot of them do that. Um, coaches who record themselves, uh, have microphones, uh, record their practices, not to watch their athletes, but to watch themselves. Oh, wow. Okay. How am I speaking? How am I acting? Yeah. Right. Uh, keeping journals. That is a very common one. A lot of coaches that I speak to do that. And uh, once I started working in management, in sport management at uh, HSC Montreal, uh, I started learning more and more how uh, very success, successful business people do keep journals uh, mm. as a uh, learning or growing strategy. So, so that builds on your intrapersonal knowledge. Yeah. So I don't think we should weed these quote unquote bad coaches out because they do have strengths and some of them are very, very good in their professional knowledge. It's just a matter of being able to develop their interpersonal and intrapersonal knowledge. And that is very important. Uh, How coaches learn, uh, a lot of coaches work by themselves, uh, sorry, learn by themselves online, reading books that sometimes help with the intrapersonal, but not with the interpersonal. 
Um, but I mean, there are exceptions. There are books about interpersonal knowledge, so uh, it, it, it depends. But I find the NCCP uh, does a great job as at, at highlighting this, uh, the importance of youth development through sport and translating a lot of these uh, strategies that coaches can use, yeah. right? To build relationships and build positive uh, uh, environments that will foster development and life skill transfer and whatnot. Uh, what is what is a challenge for the NCCP is that as a nationwide uh, program, it is difficult to then tap in into the specific characteristics of each community. True, yeah. Right? And this is where I, I like to refer to the local uh, sport programs. Mm. Uh, like the work that we do at Porto Point, that we w- work with the Montreal communities, uh, we encourage our coaches to take the NCCP program because it is very well built and uh, very strong. It's a reference worldwide. Then add to that uh, something that is more local that will uh, teach or address or have communities of practice yeah. where you can discuss what are the needs of other community and what are the resources. Remember, if you're building on strengths, it's important to identify what are the resources we have available for us yeah. and how is it that we can build on these resources. Uh, so th- that's uh, th- those would be my suggestions for these coaches on uh, uh, don't don't give up coaching because you can't communicate with your athlete. If you're good at what uh, you're doing, uh, learn and grow to be better. Learn how to communicate with them. There are generation gaps, uh, right? Uh, we have the millennials. Uh, now we have the Z generation. I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I feel that the generations keep coming quicker and quicker now. But uh, it, it's important, right? The world has changed a lot. And yeah. a lot of coaches who are 40 and 50 years old, uh, we didn't grow up with the uh, internet and the world has changed. So learning how to live and communicate in this new era is is very important. And then continue your self-growth. Um, there's a lot of a uh, elite level coaches that talk about a lifelong learner, right? Being a lifelong learner, being something very important. So there there are various strategies, but yeah, uh, generally I would recommend, uh, as I said, uh, a world-renowned NCCP program, but then I would encourage uh, coaches also to reach out to their local communities, local sports centers, local sport programs, Create community of practice with the uh, networks of coaches locally, uh, schools, uh, other teams, and uh, to identify these resources and build upon them. Oh, those three different categories of coaches is awesome. Thank you. I, I didn't know the other two. Um, and you put into context the professional uh, coaches as well. So I 100% agree with you not to weed them out because we do see um, coaches also decreasing, not just the participation of our players, but we're not, people aren't getting into coaching anymore or at a, at a slower rate or a lesser level. So my question is, is so you have the, what I kind of call the weekend coach, you know, they, their kid is playing on the team or um, they're coming in from their full-time job and they just want to help out in the community and that type of thing. What do you, what kind of, like, I know you're probably going to say they should still do this training or they should still invest in this on their own even, or to learn more on their own. If, if, um, finances are an issue and they can't afford to to pay to do these types of trainings. But what do you say to the coach who, like I just described is, you know, just kind of doing this for the fun of it and, and that type of thing, you know, what do you say to them in terms of trying to be the lifelong learner? I know I've thrown a whole bunch of hard ones at you that we didn't discuss <laughs> earlier. You're like, you didn't mention that one, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was not in the list of questions you said. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not giving any right or wrong answers here. I'm just sharing some of my yeah, exactly. opinions and experiences. <laughs> I think that what I would tell these uh, the, these uh, weekend coaches is uh, continue continue to do your work. There's There's a big discussion now about... Uh, that that uh, grassroots level coaching, right? Yeah. There are issues with how much training these people receive, how yeah. ready, how prepared they are to deal with children. 
Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, the side of the discussion is if you start placing all of these requirements and additional barriers, really, then you run out of coaches. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So right. To the point. It, needs, it, it needs to. It certainly needs to have a certain criteria, yeah. uh, but the criteria needs to be reasonable enough to allow for the opportunity of uh, youth participate in sport. Uh, less coaches uh, would mean less opportunities to play, yeah. right? Yeah. So th there's a there's a balance there and a, a, a very uh, lively discussion, I would say, in the community about that. But what I would tell the coaches that are engaged in doing that now is continue to do that, uh, continue to coach. And uh, when we talk about lifelong learners, the same way that we speak of sport as being a tool or an avenue for development uh, and transferring skills from sport to life, mm -hmm. that is also true for the coach, right? So the skills that a coach will learn coaching can apply to their life in other contexts outside of right. sport as well, right? Yeah. Uh, being able to build a positive relationship with uh, young people can help your relationship with your own children. In fact, uh, I hear a, from a lot of coaches how much they felt they became better coaches after they became parents, mm. right? The leadership, the... Uh, time management, the organization, the planning that goes into coaching can easily transfer to your work environment as well and help you there. So it's really uh, about using sport as uh, uh, the backdrop of individual personal growth and development mm -hmm. for everyone. Mm -hmm. Or we talk a lot about the athlete, but the same thing is true for the coach. Yeah. Or so for the weekend coaches out there, we talk about professional knowledge, interpersonal knowledge, intrapersonal knowledge, uh, conferences, courses, workshops, uh, and all of that a lot of times voluntarily because you're not getting paid to do any of this. Right. Sometimes you are paying to participate in these programs, but ultimately see it as uh, something that can help you grow and improve as well as a, an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, give it back to your community, uh, improving yourself, uh, your relationship with your peers and family, your uh your life at work and whatnot. It ma makes a total sense. And I never, never really thought to put that in the argument of, you know, this is for like, this can enrich your own life and the things that you're involved in outside of the sport that you're coaching. Um, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. If I, if I could just add uh, something yeah. to that in uh, when I, when we first started our, uh, my research at, uh, at Portal Point, uh, we we had set up the workshop to teach uh, the humanistic coaching, right? And as a, a young academic and researcher, I set it up as a great lecture, <laughs> just like you you teach a university. Uh, so it was a great lecture. I think a two hour lecture or whatnot. And then after we part of the study was to get feedback from the coaches. So what did you learn? How did you feel? What did you like? What did you didn't like? And one feedback that really struck me was, well, you're teaching us to do this with the children, but you're not doing it with us. Oh. So their feedback to us was be more humanistic, be more of what you're telling us to be. And that's when it struck me. I'm like, yeah, oh, I understand. you're right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, uh, at, at that moment, I started really noticing this, the, the relationship that uh, we uh, promote or we we advocate that the coaches should have with the athletes, the sport administrators should have with the coaches, mm. right? So athletic directors, uh, people running workshops, uh, the same things you're advocating your coaches to do with the athletes, and and, and then it becomes that that uh, teacher learner experience. But those yeah. are, those are not good words because it in, in, it implies a hierarchy, mm. but really a facilitator and learner or. Uh, you know, uh, th that same uh, horizontal relationship right. that we advocate where the coach should be that mentor, that facilitator, 
uh, it should be applied from the athletic, uh, the athletic director, sport administrator to the coach as well in uh, uh, giving choice, allowing the person to take a responsibility, uh, building autonomy and independence uh, mm-hmm. and growing as a person really. So this is where the, the idea of using the sport as a tool for development can touch uh, the local parties let's say involved. One of the really cool things about COVID, and there's not a lot, but one of them is that um, there have been some, I've seen a lot more coaches and I'm speaking uh, particularly at the high school level in football in various provinces, they've gathered together four or five coaches or however many, and they've created their own free uh, virtual clinics. There's been a lot of virtual clinics that have been going on and um I thought that was really cool because a, it shows that the coaches are engaged and they want to learn more. And I'm just wondering if there would be any possibility of, you know, having, um, getting these types of resources that you're talking about into the hands of those coaches so that they, it's, it's almost like a round table, I guess, like it's, they're teaching each other this information and then it goes out at that grassroots level. They don't, and they don't, don't necessarily have to pay to go to these clinics. They aren't, you know, they, they've already invested that time that they want to be there. So you don't have to convince them to go to it. Um, and then it grows from there. How can we get that information or at least a lower level of that information, a basic level into the hands of these coaches? The NCCP, the Coaching Association of Canada, has a resource page where they have a lot of the resources available there. So uh, I believe that, yeah, the courses you have to pay for, I'm not sure. I don't work for them, so I don't want to speak to them. But uh, th- th- there are resources there available. Are free resources. The yeah the the courses uh, again you have to pay but I'm not sure if there are exceptions or not mm-hmm. uh, I've never looked into that the 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 program that I'm part of here in Montreal the we offer the training for free right so okay we, sorry I thought that it was a for cost yeah. no. for profit so it's uh it's a nonprofit and uh, obviously we do a lot of the fundraising to cover the costs but the the training itself is free right. Awesome. Okay. And uh, the my feeling is that many of these community sport organizations that offer different types of services, uh, they 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 are nonprofits and they try to do their best to offer their services either for free or at a very very low cost. Right. I think uh, I don't know of any specific resource, especially in the football context, uh, to do that, uh, but. One very effective way that has become increasingly popular is through this notion of communities of practice, right? So um, bringing people in who uh, share either similar experiences or probably more similar interests or are in the similar position uh, to learn from each other, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, with these resources available for free, uh, the effort of bringing the people together would be really where your resources need to be allocated. Mm-hmm. And once these people come together, it, it becomes a process of sharing experiences, right? Uh, recently, I helped out in uh, a study, and I also have a close friend of mine from the University of Ottawa, Tiago Duarte, who uh, works with the, the idea of uh, communities of practice and social learning spaces where they try to investigate the uh, or examine the dynamics within these groups. Okay. And how is it that uh, more experienced coaches share that knowledge with the younger coaches and what mm. they learn from one another. Yeah. Right? So Thiago Duarte just recently finished his uh, doctoral dissertation at University of Ottawa. He worked with uh, Paralympic coaches uh, but the idea of uh, social learning spaces and communities of practice, this had been applied in uh, various other settings. Uh, yeah, and recently uh, I, I, I was invited to be in a committee of a study in Brazil mm-hmm. uh, that investigated the same social learning spaces, but in a Brazilian context. So I, I think that if we're talking about resources or, their, or lack thereof, uh, bringing the people together and learning from one another would be the most important thing. And in my personal experience, 
the best coaches and more experienced coaches, they're the ones willing to share more and give Mm -hmm. more. Um, They understand the importance of uh, helping the profession grow. Uh, They understand the impact they have had in the lives of youth and in the community. And they want to uh, encourage or show the way for the younger coaches. And then in this dynamic and these relationships, this is uh, where I feel everyone can really win, right? Because a 60-year, 70-year coach, it may be difficult to build on that interpersonal knowledge Mm. when uh, you're dealing with uh, people who grew up and developed in such different generations, right? So having younger coaches that could also help the more experienced and veteran coaches on how to build these relationships and how to, I don't know, we use TikTok to communicate with your athletes um, is something that is positive for everyone. So my suggestion uh, would be to look into the social learning spaces, uh, communities of practice, because they are low cost. And from there you can build on the, the, the user available resources and also really reach out to additional resources, right? Because when you have a group of people, things become cheaper and more accessible as well. Yeah. So yeah. That, that, even those that have a cost. Yeah. Well, those are, those are great points. I know we're getting down to the, to the wire here. And like you said, you, we could probably go on for a few more hours. Um, but just lastly, tell us a bit about, or or give us again who you, who you are and, and the re- the um, nonprofit that you work for and those free courses that training that you guys provide. And then just if you want to just close off with any last comments or last thoughts to leave with our viewers and our coaches and our players as well, in terms of you know just overall building relationships or the importance of it and developing both as a player and a coach that type of thing. Uh, and then we'll finish off with that. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned throughout the interview, uh, sorry, interview podcast, I'm not sure the conversation, the discussion mm-hmm. I've collaborated with this organization called Pour Trois Points. That's a four, three points in French, uh, here in Montreal. <laughs> and do they have a website? Sorry. Yeah. Do- yeah, they do. It's a uh, Pour Okay. P U U R the number three P O I N T S dot C A. Perfect. Thanks. And uh, the organization has been going on for 10 years, 11 years, maybe. And it has changed uh, throughout the time, adapted and adjusted to the different generation of coaches that have come in to uh, train and learn from us. uh, And also with the needs of uh, the community. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the format that we have today is that there is a selection process. Uh, we select a, num- a specific number of coaches depending on the resources uh, that are available, the financial resources that are available to us. And from there, as I mentioned, we offer training workshops that talk uh, focused a lot on this uh, the idea of development through sport and transformation through sport, right? So discuss uh, the role of sport in society, uh, issues in low-income communities. Yeah. Uh, the humanistic coaching, so behaviors of coaching, games for, for understanding, so how to implement these principles, how to get involved in the community, how to make positive change in the community. And then throughout the year, the, there's there are workshops uh, throughout the whole year. And then throughout the year, there's also the developmental counselors that guide the coaches in their practices because uh, the organization has established partnerships with the high schools in Montreal. So the coaches get a team to coach. So some of them have their team and they sign up for the program with the team, right. but a lot of them don't. So what I find really neat and interesting and the brilliant idea of Fabrice Ville, the founder, was really to establish these partnerships with the schools. So being able to provide the coach or the person interested in coaching with the team and have an experienced uh, coach mentor them through applying these principles right yeah uh so that yeah so the program lasts uh one year so for the whole season you're coaching that team and uh currently my role in the organization is program evaluator okay so through my uh, partnership between hcc montreal the uh, business school of the university of montreal and the organization uh i received a grant to do my postdoctoral research 
and evaluate the effectiveness of the program. Mm. So really understand what is working, what's not working, how it can get better. And we evaluate the impact of the program on coaches' behaviors. We evaluated, or I should say, try to evaluate the impact on the development of the youth. And I'll get that to that in a second. And also the impact on the community itself. So the impact on the school and the community. Yeah. What we found was that the, this type of program uh, has a, a profound effect on transforming the values and attitudes of coaches. So there's a selection process. So, of course, the coaches have that belief of sport for development, right? Mm. But it's interesting to notice that a lot of the coaches walk in wanting to do something for the community and being active members of the community and transforming the community. And as they're going through the program, they learn to transform themselves. Okay. So it changes a bit towards that in per personal knowledge and understanding to change yourself, your ways, then through that transformation, you can then impact your community, right? Mm. Uh, I'll skip to the context. And is that, an, is that a nationwide thing or is that mostly no. just in Montreal? Like, cause I, I'm thinking of a few coaches here that I want to kind of <laughs> throw your way be, that, cause I think they would be awesome for it. Um, yeah. But they're like, we're out here in BC, so. Yeah, so that, that's just in Montreal, mostly because of this partnership with the schools. Right. There has been efforts to expand within Quebec, and we're, we're going that direction. Uh, for out-of-province, out uh, the organization has developed this uh, one-day sort of mini course, let's say, and that's uh, at a cost. Mm -hmm. uh and so that that can be applied to and we're in conversations with organizations in uh, toronto and other places to give this one day course mm -hmm. right okay. so when we talk about the impact on the context uh, what we see is that uh, the schools really appreciate the program because it aligns very well with their values of using sports to help youth develop in their performance at school and whatnot yeah. and the athletic directors really like it because they according to them the coaches are very autonomous and independent mm -hmm. they don't need to be on top of the coach making sure that the coach is doing things the right way is yeah. not overemphasizing which any overdevelopment uh the the athletic directors have built this on trust let's say that the the coaches will do the right thing mm -hmm. the thing with the the athletes and this is where i wanted to get to my closing remarks uh, uh unfortunately i wasn't able to <laughs> collect the data with the athletes because of covid Right. So we had designed a research where we we're going to collect data before, during, and after the season to observe their developmental um, skills. And uh, because of COVID, the season were interrupted, so we weren't able to collect the midterm, the middle of the season data, nor right. the end of the season data. So uh, what do we do? So I got together with my research director and the organization. I said, why don't we write a book chapter about the experience of the coaches going through the pandemic? Right? Okay, yeah. And then uh, it was really interesting to find out a lot of things. And I think this is where I wanted to close with is that because we're not being allowed to practice or play, uh, I feel a lot of people feel uh, powerless and feel that they can't really do their work uh, in uh, using sport as this avenue. Yeah, to totally. Help you, right. Yeah, yeah. And what we found is that that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Right? Now, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the situation is ideal because it's far from ideal in any way. Uh, but what the what the youth development through sport research shows is that the key aspects of it uh, uh, that allow for positive development is the relationship with the coach sorry the coach athlete relationship and building that trusting relationship mm -hmm. and also applying or transferring these life skills outside the sport right so being at home uh the relationship between the coach and the athlete is still based on the sport in a way or another and being at home really uh brings the sport outside of the sport environment 
Uh, right? yeah, true. So yeah. In many ways, it forces the coaches and the athletes to really uh, try to use these skills that you learn in the sport context. Mm -hmm. of sport. So it is, again, I wouldn't call it ideal, but it is a great time or a great opportunity to transfer these skills. Yeah. And so I encourage uh, coaches, strongly encourage coaches to continue, do their best to communicate as much as possible and as openly as possible with their athletes as frequently as possible and uh, try to learn about their lives outside of sports. So not yeah. just if they were able to do their workout at home in their bedroom or whatnot, but going beyond that and trying to understand what is going on with school, virtual school, uh, how are their relationships at home uh, yeah. and try to tap into that and uh, mentor them and guide them through those things and using sport as a context. Yeah. Uh, you're a leader on the field, uh, be a leader at home, uh, be a leader among mm. your peers, uh, check on your peers to make sure everyone's okay. Uh, yeah. Mental health has become a, a increasingly serious issue, especially now with all this uh, isolation, right? right. So uh, using all these skills and qualities that every coach knows that they teach through sport. And now is the time to really uh, make that push to transfer these life skills to uh, other settings because yeah. that's where the kids are so the sport is still there the we may not have the helmets we may not have the footballs we may not have the the fields but uh the relationships are there yeah and the relationship between the teammates the relationship between coaches and athletes those are still there so we can still use that and uh bring the skills that we learn in sport outside of sport yeah, that's awesome. That those are those are great closing comments. William, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, like I said, and taking the time to give us a bit more information. I know that we haven't had anyone uh, talk more specifically from a coach, like the coaches training and, and the, their role and all that in, in sport. So I really appreciate that information. I know that I learned even more after, like, cause I've talked to you uh, before, but through this podcast, there's stuff that you've caused me to pause and not weed those coaches out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't weed those coaches out. <laughs> Build on strengths. <laughs> I love that. I think that's awesome. And I, and I really hope that the people listening to this um, also really take that to heart because truly there's so much negativity in the world. So why, why would we do it that way? Um, always try to build on the positive of things. And I think that's, uh, that I think it's a very strong message. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, great to have these conversations. Uh, it's good to get a little bit out of the research academic setting and actually talk to the practitioners and people who are yeah. um, doing, uh, applying uh, what we study. So yeah, it was, it was a pleasure to talk uh, to them, uh, to you. And thank you for all the questions and the invitation to be here. For more information on Tackle It and how you can become a Tackle It ambassador, you can visit our website at tackleit.org. If you would like to tell your story, please email us at tellyourstory at tackleit.org. We all need a champion, and we bring you these with those who are willing to tell their story.